I, uh, I, I, I am so happy that I got to walk out to that great new British band, One Direction. I don't know if any of you uh, <laughs> get tween music humor. Anyway, uh, I'm Michael Bracey. I'm one of the co-founders of Future Music Coalition, and it is my immense honor to welcome all of you uh, and those watching live online to our 12th Future of Music Summit here at Georgetown University. Uh, we're, we're 13 years old, 12th Summit, yeah. The, um, which means that this is the final year between the summit is actually a tween. So we're right at that kind of difficult stage between, uh, you know, still being <clears throat> under tween age. But, um, but we are going to be tweening out a little bit this week, and it's going to be a, a, a we hope, a lovely event. Um, we really spent a lot of time this year um, thinking about why do we do the summit? Why do you, you people come to the summit? Why do people watch the summit? And we really were, were we thought a lot about um, some basic issues, in, in, including the idea of community and the idea of why people come to this event, why uh, hopefully what people get out of this event. And some of it is what happens here on stage, but really a lot more about it is the conversations that happen uh, out here in the audience and, and on campus over the next couple of days and virtually via Twitter and, and via the net and the webs. And what we're really you know, trying to focus on again is the idea that there's so many complex, difficult issues that face the music community and face musicians that nobody has all the answers. And this has always been the underpinning of this conference, that there are lots of people with lots of different perspectives and lots of information and lots of vision and lots of ideas. And if we can try to create a community and a sense of people working together to try to put together these pieces, then we're doing something that's productive and a good use of time. And so what we've done this year with the summit is we've tried to build in more space. You know, the agenda is always packed. There's a lot of great panels. There are a lot of great presentations. Sometimes there's not a lot, a, a chance to breathe. And what we really want to encourage people to do this year is breathe. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, take a walk, go grab somebody, go get some coffee. We've got more time for lunches. And then what we're also doing is, is, is we're really trying to do some fun stuff in the evenings and really hope that you all are able to join us and, and come out and be part of that. So tonight, for the first time, we're doing the Future Music Honors event, which we're incredibly proud of. We're honoring three um, categories uh, of, of individuals who have done exemplary work uh, over the lifetime of, of our organization. And we'll talk more about those honorees uh, throughout the day. But the honors event is going to be wonderful. And then uh, Wayne Kramer and, and his crew from Jail Cut Our Doors are doing a late night rock show uh, at the Hamilton, which we really hope you can come see. Um, yesterday, I ha had the opportunity um, to go to jail with Wayne Kramer and, and Jill Sobule and went up to the the uh, Patuxent Correctional Facility up in Maryland to observe and, and be part of uh, the events that they do at Jail Cadar Doors, where they bring in instruments and, um, and sit down and talk and, and essentially do a mini workshop with, with people who have been incarcerated and talk about, Wayne is able to talk about his personal story and, and the fact that he is someone who, who uh, is a felon, is an offender, and an ex-offender, and is also a musician and talk about the, the transformative uh, role that music has played not only in his life but in the lives of others and the ability for music um, to be so key to expression and, and so, so central to speech. And then on the way back from, from that trip, which was obviously very moving and, and very complex and complicated, uh, you know, I got the news about Lou Reed. And, you know, for the last day or so, I've, I've been thinking back to those moments that in my life were very visceral uh, with, with Lou and his music. And the first time I heard Sweet Jane when I was 17 years old. And, you know, the late nights when we would get out the guitars and, and, and see if we could get through the entirety of Sister Ray. Or the time I, you know, made one of my colleagues listen to Berlin on a cross-country uh, airplane trip because she hadn't heard it before. And all these moments, and, and what it really reinforced for me is, you know, really the reason we do this work here at Future Music is that, you know, everybody in this room has their own Lou Reed. You know, they have someone whose music has been central to the experiences that they have, and they can hear a song and they can be transported back into place, you know, in a moment. And it is so vitally important to think about music not just as entertainment or not just as something that is on the margins or not just a, you know, a widget where people can make money off of it. But music is central to who we are as individuals and, and who we are as people. And, and it's so important, such an important part of our experience. And again, that's why we do this work and that's why you all come to this conference because it, it's really too important to not try to do this hard work. You know, we've said now for, for 13 years, there's never going to be a five point plan that's going to save the music industry. The issues are phenomenally complicated and difficult. This is a time of great uh, enthusiasm and excitement in many areas uh, for culture and for emerging business models. 
and the fact we're going to get a thousand new non-commercial radio stations this year because of the passage of the Lepar radio legislation. And there's a lot of stuff that we can celebrate and feel good about. And there's a lot of stuff that is really, really, really hard. And we're going to talk about all that uh, over the next couple of days and, and a lot more. So thank you uh, for, for coming. Thank you to Georgetown University for being such a wonderful partner. Thank you to our sponsors and the people who help invest in the conference so it can actually take place. And uh, we look forward to a lovely couple of days. Uh, now it's my pleasure and my honor to turn the stage over to our partner and co-founder at Future Music Coalition, Kristen Thompson. Good morning, everybody. Look at this, I have to have two laptops. Um, so my name is Kristen Thompson. I'm with the Future of Music Coalition. I've been with FMC since it started. And, oh boy, this is what's changed my eyesight. Um, <laughs> so um, I thought we'd be start off the day with something fun, a pop quiz. So do you have your pencils? What, you don't? Well, um, so I have a question up here. A band with a new release is invited to play live on Late Night with Jimmy Fallon. Are they paid for that? Now, we have a very educated audience, so I have a sense that you know the answer. But here are some options that we give people. A, no, on, their only payment is the promotional benefit of playing the show. Yes, Jimmy Fallon pays, negotiates an appearance fee, just like any other gig. And the third one, yes, the band gets an appearance fee, as per the show's SAG-AFTRA and AFFM contracts and residual payments each time the show re-airs. And the band's songwriters will also be paid performance royalties by their PRO each time the show airs. So which answer is right? That's right, you guys are so smart. So yes, the answer is C. Um, that was one of the questions in the expert section of our music and money quizzes. Uh, a set of quizzes we've been running since June that use practical, real-world examples to test musicians' knowledge of copyright laws and the business practices that determine how money flows back to various rights holders. So the quizzes have been in the field for about 120 days, and we've had over 2,000 of them completed. And um, this has given us some interesting data to examine about quiz takers' understanding and their knowledge gaps. So for example, if we look at the results of the easy quiz, which uh, over 1,300 folks have completed, um, you can see the aggregate score, the average score for all folks is 67%. Uh, and unless we're grading on a serious curve, that is not an A. But here are, um, but you know, there are here a couple of questions that survey takers found particularly difficult. Because there's some at the beginning of the quiz that lots of people got right. The really basic ones about, um, you know, do you, when, do you, when can you apply for copyright or when is something copyrighted and things like that. But, Here's a question that was tough for folks. We asked whether a band that's recording some new material decides to do a cover of the Rolling Stones song, Brown Sugar. So who did they need to get permission from before recording the cover? We gave them these options, which, you know, these all seem legit, right? The answers say half the folks thought they needed to get um, ad advance permission from Rolling Stone's publisher, um, and then 42% correct, correctly got it, that they don't need advance permission. What they do need, the US Copyright Act states that um, once a copyright owner has recorded and distributed a work publicly, a compulsory license, mechanical license is available to anyone else who wants to record and distribute the work in the US. As long as the artist doing the cover gets that license within 30 days of recording, and then pays the mechanical license fees at the statutory compulsory rate. Lots of folks already know that in this room, but this was a tough question for people. Now, at least they got in the right category that they do need permission at some point, <laughs> or they do need to, to have some relationship with the existing song. Um, so there's that. Now, we had a, a question that was right after this one that said, OK, so they've recorded this brown sugar cover. They sell 500 uh, downloads of it, and they sell 500 vinyl copies of the record. So how much is that worth in mechanical royalties? And we gave them these options. And uh, let's tell in a second. We gave them these options. And here is what folks thought. 
about, only about a quarter of respondents got um, the proper answer, which is $91. Lots of folks thought it was 9.1% of net sales, which is close. At least we're using the statute, we're using the numbers that are part of the <laughs> calculation for mechanical royalties for songs under five minutes. But you can see that what we see through these quizzes, and if I talked about all 38 or 40 questions, you would realize that there's a lack of awareness um, or a general confusion about the difference between the rights associated with musical compositions and sound recordings. But as many of you in this audience know, this is tough stuff, and it exposes some of the funny quirks and traits of copyright law, some of which are even quirkier and weirder um, as they've been forced to adapt to a digital music landscape that involves uses of compositions and sound recordings in ways that the original Copyright Act could never have imagined. And so a lot of them have been altered to sort of fit into these new categories. So cut folks some slack. These are some hard questions. And um, so let's look at the medium quiz. Whoop. So fewer folks have taken this uh, quiz, 374, but the average is actually lower at 862%. Um, and here's one of the questions that was particularly tough. Um, we asked if members of an orchestra get paid if they do a recent recording of a Stravinsky piece on a major label, and that, that is made available for sale on iTunes. This is not an uncommon instance, but the reason we asked this question was that orchest orchestras have a slightly different mechanism for payment. So we gave them these options, 38% properly got that orchestra members who participated in the recording session are eligible for payments from the Sound Recording Special Payments Fund. Um, but, you know, all these other answers are kind of legit sounding, and so I can't, you know, there, there's possibility that makes sense, and some of them are just a little slightly confused by what Sound Exchange does versus iTunes sales, you know? So that is what happens. There's a bit of dispersion around that answer. With the hard quiz, we've had fewer completes or just fewer people taking it, but the average is a little bit better. Um, I, we asked, this one had a lot of folks, uh, it was a challenge for some people. We asked if there's a DJ that mashes up big songs, yet recognizable songs that remain recognizable. Um, does he need permission from rights holders to perform these mixes live, like in a club? And we, no, actually, as long as the venue and the festival or the festival he's performing at have performance licenses from the PROs, he, that per, the performer doesn't need the permission. What is um, obvious is that a lot of folks thought, yes, he does need permission, but that would only take, that would only um, come into play if that was a sound recording of the mashups, which in that case, A, would be correct. So... Less, oh, but you know, again, this is a subtle question, but one that's incre increasingly real as more DJs do performances in venues. So this happens a lot. So lest you think that this is some cruel exercise in asking musicians tricky questions about all the weirdo parts of the music industry and then pointing fingers at their wrong answers, I should note that taking the quiz itself is designed to be educational. Each quiz mark question is marked in real time, so as you take it, you know it, if, whether you got it right or wrong right away. And um, whether the person gets it right or wrong, we provide an explanation right below it, and then links to additional resources to you know, answer their questions or do follow-up. And then when you finish a quiz, you get a complete summary of all the answers you can keep if you want. And you also get a copy of your score. So um, the Money for Music quizzes are designed to educate musicians about the contours of copyright law and business practice in a fun way, and give us, as advocates and educators, a sense of where the knowledge gaps are. We're happy to share the results with any adv advocacy groups or educators um, who want to better understand what trips up musicians. If you're designing courses or uh, seminars or panels, these might be helpful. We can also build um, custom quiz sets if you're an educator and you want to, t to test your students' baseline knowledge, it's not hard for us to build it, and we put a little code at the front so you know who your students are, and then we can give you the results. So if you're interested in those things, just come talk to me in the next couple of days. 
And the quizzes are really just another thing that FMC has done over the years. It adds to the, the resources that we offer and continue to manage um, on our website that are uh, offered to edu educate and inform musicians. Um, in addition to FMC's blog and website and our social media and our research and the analyses we do, we offer um, lots of stuff that translates and distills these complex in issues. And for example, uh, for a number of years, we've kept this new business model spreadsheet available, which itemizes about 40 different, different models and if and how um, performers, copyright owners, publishers, and songwriters are paid through all the different channels. We have a digital distribution worksheet that shows how you get your music into these platforms and then how much it costs and all that stuff, the really basic stuff. And then over here, we did an infographic over the summer. Um, this is actually has a slightly different purpose, and it, it's um, sort of a, a materials that corrects the record, where there's misunderstandings about how the money flows, which can falsely influence readers' perceptions. So, for example, there's a common misunderstanding, there's a common conflation that Pandora and Spotify, about between the two, which makes readers think they operate under the same licensing framework because they're often referenced in the same news articles as, as, as like peers of each other. But I think folks in this room know they operate under different licensing frameworks and they are in fact quite different in how they pay rights holders. So this infographic tried to um, give a visualization of the differences, um, which is available online. And we also have a poster of it available at the front desk um, if you'd like to hang it on your wall, <laughs> which is it's sort of a par partially my own um, interest in like having a way to think about it um, on a really granular level. So we wanted to make sure we could underscore the differences. We also have our Artist Revenue Streams project, which for the past three years, we've been examining how musicians' revenue streams are changing over time and why. Gene Cook will be up here in just a minute to talk a bit about some recent work we've been doing on that. but some stuff that's actually, in, in addition to the findings and the data memos we've been doing, the most popular item on the website is uh, the 42 revenue streams page, which lists off, it's a comprehensive list of all the ways that musicians can make money off their compositions, their performances, their sound recordings, their brand, or their knowledge of the craft. And in addition to 42 streams, we have another version of it, same information, but organized into columns based on whether the revenue stream is existing, expanded, or new. So these things are um, part of what uh, FMC offers on a daily basis to make sure musicians can um, understand what's going on. And it's the core reason that we continue to organize events like this. Change is exciting, but it's also unsettling. And you can see that right in our, whoops, in our, in our uh, mission statement, education, research, and advocacy, um, those aren't random words. We think that all three are critical to building a healthy music ecosystem. And FMC remains committed to distilling and translating these complex issues to make sure that musicians can make smart, informed decisions that make a vibrant music landscape possible. So thanks again for coming. And I'd like to invite Jean Cook up to talk a bit more about artist revenue streams. I'm just curious, how many of you uh, knew about the quizzes before this morning? Did you take it? How'd you do? Mm, okay. Um, well, I have a presentation here. Um, okay, that's working great. My name is Jean Cook. Um, I'm the Director of Programs for Future of Music Coalition, and I'm the co-director of the Artist Revenue Streams Project, which Kristen mentioned. It's a research initiative that's gathered the broadest and most detailed existing data set about US musician income. 
So this data set is, um, we've been collecting it over the last few years. It includes 81 in-depth personal interviews with artists, six anonymous financial case studies, and then answers, uh, 5,300 musicians took the money from music survey. So what that's meant is that over the last few years, our team uh, of three has been literally, or not literally, figuratively, I guess, drowning in data. Because how that actually translates, those 81 interviews actually means hundreds of pages of interview transcripts. And those financial case studies means thousands of pages of financial records from individual artists. And with 5,300 people taking, in some cases, uh, 110 question quiz, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of data points that we've been kind of sorting through over the last few years. Um, so to date, we've published more than 20 data memos at music, uh, sorry, at money.futureofmusic.org. Today's presentation is a sneak preview on our forthcoming report about the value of music. So I'm going to review some qualitative but mostly quantitative data that addresses four main points. The first bucket of um, what I'm going to present to you is, is talking about the conflation of value and money. The second thing I want to talk about is um, I'm going to review some data about the experiences of those musicians who feel that their work has been devalued. The third uh, section is going to take a look at copyright's impact on income for musicians by role and also by genre. And then finally, we're also going to take a look at how gross numbers, focusing on gross numbers, can distort value, um, using some examples from our data as well. So first we're going to look at the conflation of value and money. So how do you measure value? So in the music business, it's common to encounter arguments about the value of music, where the arguments are focused on money. Uh, how much is a Spotify stream worth, for example? Or how much did that tour gross? So we also hear value described in the context of having a lot of fans or press or eyeballs being monetized. Uh, critics and artists might talk about the artistic value or influence of a particular record or song. Uh, being able to attract sponsors or labels who can invest in you because of your strong brand. Offering something that no one else has, has value. In our interviews, when we asked people to talk about value, they described all of these things and a lot more. So there are two basic takeaways from this first piece. First, we recognize the limitations of talking about the value of music through the narrow lens of money, especially when you're trying to understand how value shifts during disruptive technological transitions. You're only looking at one part of a large and really complex picture. But if you are going to focus on money, especially in reference to what's good for the artist, and this is the second takeaway, it's important to understand the distinction between the money that's generated throughout the industry by an artist's work and the money that actually ends up in the artist's bank account. So we have an illustration. The money that gets generated throughout the industry for an artist's work, this is kind of how I think about it in my head. And then the money that actually ends up in the musician's bank account. OK. Um, so that's the first section, very brief. Um, the second section is going to take a look at some data. And uh, this is going to get a little bit deeper. Uh, this is the experiences of uh, musicians who feel that their work has been devalued. Towards the end of the survey, we asked respondents to rate how strongly they agreed or disagreed with statements about how emerging technologies impacted their careers, with over 4,500 people uh, answering that question. So 1,297, or 28% of the respondents, agreed or strongly agreed with the statement my music has been devalued. The next few slides are going to compare the pool of people, people who agreed with that statement that their music had been devalued with those who did not agree. To help you through this section, uh, let's call those who agree that their music has been devalued Sad Sam. And uh, those who disagree that their music has been devalued, let's call them Happy Harry. So first, let's look at the difference between Sam and Harry's revenue pies. So the one on the left, again, is people who agree that their music has been devalued. Those are the sad Sams. And on the right, the pool of uh, uh, sorry. And on the right, we've got the happy Harrys. So those are the people who disagree that their music has been devalued. 
So the pool of respondents, so the sad SAMs, they're earning on average about $37,653 in gross estimated music income. Happy Harry's are about earning about $4,500 less on average, $33,000. Because not all musicians are working full time, we also looked at the hourly wage for both groups just to see what the difference was so we could get a better comparison. Sad Sam's are grossing about $27 an hour and Happy Harry's are grossing about 23. When you look at the actual revenue pies, you see that both types of musicians are earning roughly the same share of revenue from most categories, with three exceptions. Sad Sam's are earning a larger share of their income from compositions and recordings. That's the uh, red and the orange wedges. Um, that's about 4% and 3% respectively. So going the other way, Happy Harry's are earning a larger share of their income from teaching about 5% more. So just to summarize, so the average Happy Harry's music income and hourly rate is less than a Sad Sam. And Sad Sam's are earning more from composing and recording income streams than Happy Harry's. And then Happy Harry's are earning more from teaching. Now the second one is kind of interesting because they're earning more from composing and recording income streams in terms of their revenue share, but also overall considering that their income is higher than the Happy Harry's. So, um, is everybody, is this all making sense so far? Okay, cool. Um, so the gray slice in this pie, that's the other category. So that's made up of many other revenue streams, including the 13 on this slide. This chart measures how many respondents participated in these other revenue streams. This is not a measurement of the amount of income from these streams, it's just how many people said yes, I participate in this revenue stream. So sad Sam's, are more likely to earn income from all of these streams uh, than Happy Harry's. So in some cases, a lot more. In some cases, just a little bit more. Um, we didn't show you all of them because they wouldn't fit in one chart. There are about 23 streams. Uh, sorry, there are 20 streams in the other category. The only revenue streams where Happy Harry's were more likely to participate in that income, in that revenue stream, uh, was uh, grants. So. Uh, so just to review this last chart that we just saw, it was the gray sliver of the revenue pie, so the other category. Sad Sam's are more likely to be earning nearly all of the other revenue streams than Happy Harry's. The only place where Happy Harry's are more likely to be earning money in the other revenue category is grants. So um, this next chart takes a look at perceived changes in income by both groups. So here we've got seven categories of income. We've got session work, recording, live performance, salary from an orchestra or band, merchandise, et cetera. The first line of each category looks at Happy Harry's. The second, si <laughs> the second uh, line of each category looks at Sad Sam's. The question we asked was, has each revenue stream increased, decreased, or stayed the same? And the two things that I want, there are two things that I want to point out about this chart. The first one I want to point out is the gray bars. Yeah, you can still see them, great. Um, the size of these bars gives you a sense of how many respondents participate in each of these streams. So for example, 69% of Sad Sam's participated in session work as a revenue stream, compared to 60% of Happy Harry's. 68% of Sad Sam's participated in recording income as a revenue stream compared to 52% of Happy Harry's, and so on. So the first takeaway is this. Sad Sam's are more likely to participate in all of these revenue streams, with the exception of teaching and salary. The second point is that Sad Sam's are clearly perceiving their gains to be less great and their losses to be worse than Happy Harry's. As an example here, we've got 21% more of Sad Sam's reporting a decrease in their session work than reporting increases. This compares to 3% for Happy Harry's. For recording revenue, 17% more of Sad Sam's reported a decrease in their session work revenue stream than reported increases. This compares to 1% for Happy Harry's. Where there's a net gain reported for live music for Happy Harry's, there's a significant net loss for Sad Sam's. So what we're seeing is that there's a large perception gap between how the revenue is flowing 
between the Sad Sams and the Happy Harrys. And across the board, the perceived losses over the last five years are worse, and the gains are smaller for the Sad Sams. Okay, so the final chart on the Sad Sams and the Happy Harrys looks at the differences by genre and by role. Here we have four categories of artists with no overlaps in between them. Classical musicians, jazz musicians, those who identify their primary genre as composer. Yes, you heard me right. When we asked people what their genre was, we gave it an option for people to say that they were composers, implying that they worked in many different genres. And we have 206 people who insisted that the composer was their genre. And then we also had everybody else in the, in the last category where 1,970 people sit. So here you can see the classical musicians are less likely to be sad Sams, with only 21% agreeing that their music has been devalued. On the other end of the scale, composers are the most likely of the four groups to be sad Sams, with 37% agreeing that their music has been devalued. Jazz musicians and other genres were in between, with 32% agreeing. So what else can we tell you about sad Sams and happy Harrys? Sad Sams have more years of experience than Happy Harrys, but they're not necessarily older. Sad Sams have more releases and they've, uh, and they've written more songs. They participate in more union-related income streams, but are not more likely to be members of the union. Sad Sams are more likely than Happy Harrys to be highly comfortable using technology to promote and distribute their music. And they're slightly more likely to be male but not that much more, uh, that was a joke. Um, Los Angeles-based musicians are more likely to be sad Sams than musicians from Nashville, New York, Chicago, Austin, San Francisco, or any other location. In short, sad Sams appear to be, on the face of it, and by many different measures, more successful than Happy Harry's, and they're more likely to believe that their music has been devalued. So we're now gonna leave the world of Sad Sam and Happy Harry. I'm not gonna do any more with them for the moment. We're going to look at the third section, which takes a look at copyright's impact on musicians by role and by genre. It's two charts. For the first chart, um, we divided the seven categories of music income into three buckets. So when you look at directly related to copyright under songwriting and composing, this includes, it, this includes publisher advances, mechanical royalties, PRO royalties, commissions, sync licensing, ringtone licensing, and sheet music sales. Sound recording includes sales of physical or digital recordings, uh, which includes uh, both retail and sales at shows. Uh, it includes payments from interactive services like Rhapsody or Spotify. Sound exchange royalties, master use licensing or for syncs, um, or also for ringtones. On the other side, we've got Indirect and unrelated, that's touring, shows, live performance fees, teaching, salary as an employee of a symphony or band or ensemble as a performing employee, um, or merchandise. And then in between, we've got uh, session musician earnings. This is called a mixed relationship uh, because it includes both payment for work in the recording studio, which would be have a closer relationship to copyright, and also for live performances, which has a less direct relationship. So we're going to look at the distribution of these buckets by jazz, classical, composer, and other. So here you can see that 14% of income for classical musicians had a direct relationship or a mixed relationship to copyright. 17% of jazz income has a direct or mixed relationship. Over half of composer's income has a direct or mixed relationship to copyright. For other genres, the number is 27%. Um, this, chicken, this second chart is kind of a fun one that I thought I'd try out. Um, it's, estimated, it's the estimated aggregate dollar value of each revenue category. So what does that mean? Each respondent told us what their gross income was from all sources, and then what percentage of their revenue came from music. Then they told us how that music revenue was broken down among these eight buckets. We added up all of the money in each bucket for over 5,000 respondents, and that gives us this chart here, which is in millions of dollars. So nearly $173 million um, in gross music-related revenue was earned by our sample. Of that total, using the categories that we defined earlier, about $24 million of revenue was earned uh, that had a direct relationship to copyright. $20 million was mixed. 
and $129 million uh, was earned that had an indirect or unrelated relationship to copyright. So the two takeaways from this section are pretty simple. The amount of income that you derive from copyright depends on your genre and whether or not you're a composer. Uh, a little less than a quarter of the income reported to us in the Money from Music survey had a direct or mixed relationship to copyright. And um, the importance of that really goes up when you consider that this is all income before expenses. So the importance of the copyright income as well uh, can change once you understand the difference between net and gross. And that's actually what this last point of this presentation is going to be. So um, this last section is a really important one, and it's about how relying on gross numbers can distort value. Basically, it's about the difference between net and gross. All of the charts that you've seen so far have been reports of gross earnings before expenses, and that's because it's really complicated to try and collect expense information in a broad survey uh, like the Money for Music survey in any kind of accurate or consistent way. So for this section, we're actually going to analyze the data that's um, collected in the case studies where we had access to detailed expense uh, and income information. So here's the first example. So this is a jazz band leader. This chart notes his income above the middle line and his expenses below the middle line. The silver line that runs through all of the con columns indicates the net, or the difference between income and expenses from year to year. Because we're able to um, work with very detailed expense information, remember the thousands of pages of financial reports? Those are real. Um, Kristen and I had to look at all of them. Uh, <laughs> it's true. Um, we're able to match certain expenses to income. So for example, plane tickets are paying sidemen for a tour can be subtracted out of the tour receipts. Merchandise costs can be taken out of the gross merchandise income. So here is the ba jazz band leader's income after expenses for the entire period of 2006 to 2011. As you can see, he took home about 28% of his gross income overall. And when you look at the specific revenue categories, net versus gross, he took, about, took home about 21% of his touring income. 19% of his grant income, and 31% of his recording income. You can read more about his story in our case study reports at money.futureofmusic.org. So this is a jazz band leader. The second example is the indie rock composer performer. So here again, you have his income and expenses from 2008 to 2011. The income's above the line, expenses are below the line, and the silver line indicates the net income from year to year. So um, he earns money both as a salaried member of a popular band, which is showed in light blue on this page, and also as a solo leader of his own ensemble, which is shown in darker blue and labeled live. Here's the artist's income after expenses for the entire period of 2008 to 2011. He took, up, he took home about 55% of his gross income. Looking at the specific revenue categories, net versus gross, his tours and recordings lost money. He took home about 69% of his merchandising money after expenses. And basically, understanding that, when you look at this chart again, you see that in the first three years ch shown on this chart, his work as a salaried member of the band effect effectively subsidized his solo career. More about this case study can also be found at money.futureofmusic.org. The third and the last example from our case studies is a chamber music group. So you can see their income and expenses uh, from the years 2002 to 2010. Again, income is above the line, expenses are below the line, and the net line that goes through indicates income minus expenses. Unlike the previous two examples, this group's income is almost entirely made up of live performance fees. After expenses, they take home about 49% of their income. And looking at specific revenue categories, net versus gross, they take home about 50% of their touring money and about 37% of their profits from sales of CDs on the road. I have other examples, but we're short on time. They're all at money.futureofmusic.org. Um, but the basic takeaways from this section are that live performance and recording income 
as well as merchandise and grants, they very often have significant expenses attached to them. Some of the less expensive influence streams include salary, session, and composition money. For many as well, teaching can also be a stable source of income. So those are the four sections of this presentation. It's, again, a sneak preview of some of the analysis that we're going to be presenting in our next data menu, data memo, which is called The Value of Music, and that's going to be published again at money.futureofmusic.org in the coming months. So um, feel free to grab me if you want to discuss what you saw or if you have questions or concerns. We're very interested in getting feedback before we publish. I'm going to leave you with um, a quote from the qualitative piece um, from one of our interviewees. And then also here is my email address where we can't connect. And I think, do we have time to take a couple of questions? Um, I think we do have a little bit of time. So if anybody wants to ask some questions, I can take them now. Yes. Can you come up to the mic, please? Because we're webcasting this, uh, we want to make sure that people are able to hear your question. I was really just going to ask if you could show that slide again with the different streams of in income. Do you remember that one with where you said teaching was like 41.4 million and... Oh yeah, sure. Okay, thanks. So this is the aggregate dollar value of the money earned by the people who took the survey, the money from music survey. So that's just, um, this is just 5,000 people that 5,000 people's revenue divided into buckets and all added up. Is there another question? Yeah, do you mind coming down to the mic? Oh, and I also wanted to say special thanks to Erin McKeown for letting me use her picture in my presentation. Hi. From the opposite world of the arts, and I've been addressing copyright, unauthorized threat theft, and piracy. What I'm hearing from you is something I recently came to the understanding of. Sad Sam and Happy Harry are maybe the difference between a real working artist and someone who dabbles in it, and it may be a future. So as, as I've been addressing the two-dimensional arts world of copyrights, I'm finding that people who have a job and aren't worried about this being their income, have a different regard to even understanding copyright, the value of it, and their attitudes greatly um, disrupts the value of the professional artist. And I think this is the same for every industry. And one of the points I keep on making is that we have to look at copyright as a whole. It's one wheel and multiple models. So the issue of music copyright is no different than the issue of photography copyright or arts copyright or writing copyright. We need to understand there are the professionals. There are the people that start out that are learning. And then they're the ones that more often disrupt our value as it's perceived and reported in reports to Congress. So that's a little bit of the feedback I've been getting. Because I'll talk to people about a copyright, they'll say, my goodness, you're so passionate about it. I've been doing it since I'm 19. And they're, what they're doing, they're not understanding our value, greatly hurts the integrity of my work and the work of the professional mus musicians here, too. Thank you very much. I was curious, for those of you who saw the Sad Sam and the Happy Harry presentation, for how many of you, like, was this kind of, you already knew about this. This all kind of reinforces your experiences in the music world. Oh, huh. okay. And for how many of you was it kind of a surprise? Oh, interesting. So after having looked at that and thought about it, would you say that you know some sad Sams? <laughs> Are a lot of sad Sams here?
Thanks. That's really interesting. Was everybody able to hear him? No? Okay, so I'll just paraphrase, um, which is that because sad Sams don't have the same kind of stability that happy Harrys do because they teach less, uh, it's a very up and down kind of income model, and it's a freelance model, and it's one where they feel that their work has been devalued partially because it's just constantly going up and down, and also they just it's very unpredictable. Does that sound about? Yes. Okay. Um, I am kind of curious about the people in, in the room uh, because there are so many who seem to kind of, uh, the sad Sam thing resonates. Um, are there other ideas or theories or thoughts about why they may feel that their music is devalued? And if so, do you mind coming up to the microphone so everybody can hear? Well, you already spoke, so let's let her go first. Yeah. Right, if I ask one question on methodology before answering sure. um, is that was there any measure as to um, try to ascertain the reliability of the self-reported data as a as an indie musician, I could imagine in moments of frustration, like overstating hours and understating income, not be, not at a willful deception, but because so few musicians maybe really log in, like, yeah, I'm at the piano for an hour and a half, you know, mm -hmm. and keep records like that. That's a really important question. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, so as I mentioned, um, this is the most kind of thorough and largest data set about musicians, which actually isn't, I mean, it's impressive, but it's actually kind of not impressive. It's just that there's no data about musicians that are out there. Um, we have been able to take a look at the comparisons between our data set and then also some rand randomly selected data, so, people, uh, so a population that isn't uh, self-selected, and that would be from the census. Um, again, the census has its own problems, but it, you know, self-selection is, is not as bad for that as it is for our data set. And in that uh, data set, we've taken a look at, um, we've done spot checks on different cities. We've taken a look at um, the average income for people who reported their income as music. We looked at the demographic differences, male versus female, and um, age, and then we've also looked at um, race as well. And um, you know, there's not a whole lot you can do with that because it doesn't go into genre, it doesn't go into people with multiple jobs, independent contractors are considered kind of separately, so it's, um, it's an imperfect comparison, but when we did take a look at that, I mean, for what that's worth, um, we did find that we're actually not that far off. So, uh, red dress. Nice dress, by the way. Thank you. Uh, I guess my, uh, it's a comment and a question. I guess I would be in the happy Harry situation because I'm an attorney, but uh, making money off of entertainment has been uh, relatively new for me. And uh, from, the feedback I'm getting from various clients, it seems like the younger clients do tend to be um, more optimistic, but like you said, it's the one who have been doing it for much longer uh, have come across less optimistic. And I'm just wondering if the difference could be, not necessarily they think it's, I'm wondering if the difference could be the perception of, of what's devalued is, it could be twofold. It could be one, like I think about the older producers and they get away with uh, less, control, or they, they, they now don't get away with as much control as they used to, let's put it that way, where they would have more percentages or more rights or, or like you said, direct copyright ownership, which people don't give up as willingly uh, anymore. And then the second would be for the younger artists, um, uh, like the gentleman said earlier, being more independent and releasing music on their own or independent of what they had contracted with, with say a record label or something like that. and. Um, therefore kind of diversifying the re revenue streams away from that controlled environment. Does that make sense? <laughs> the question, I mean? I think so. I mean, what you're saying kind of resonates a little bit with me because in the interviews that we conducted, so we conducted over 81 interviews, and these were like hour-long interviews where you sat down and you talked to people. And for, for most of them, we asked them the question about the value of music. And when people talked about value, as I mentioned in the first section, of this presentation, they're not just talking about money. And sometimes they are, in some cases, they are talking about things like control. Um, and that sometimes that's almost as important or just as important in some ways. And for them, that that's kind of an indicator of value. Tim? Yeah. Oh, you're next. Sorry. I was actually going to kind of raise that same point. Um, the, you, 
didn't present it to us, but I'm wondering whether you took uh, data of how much, how many shows people are playing and how many sales and albums they're doing and how that compares. Because they might be selling more music but making less of it, even though comparatively between Happy Harry and Sad Sam, Sad Sam's making more money, they just might be making less per each than they used to. I think we know how many shows they did. Um, and, I, and we know how many how many records they've made and how many songs they've done, but I don't know if we know how many records they sold. Um, but what I can tell you is that the Sad Sams have written more songs and they have made more recordings than the Happy Harrys. And I'll have to take a look at the tour ones because I, I don't remember if I took a look at that, but I wouldn't be surprised if they toured more as, as, as well because their touring income tended to be higher. So that was my take on that. Yeah. Tim? The thing that surprised me from the charts was actually how little, how small the difference in average income between the Happy Harrys and the Sad Sams was, um, and which I think actually belies the notion that, oh, if you're not sad, you're just a hobbyist. I think public service announcement, beware of people who say things like that. I, I really doubt them. Um, but since averages can, can lie, uh, and you're closer to all this data, is that how precipitous is the drop for the Sad Sams compared to the Happy Harrys, in your, based on what you've seen? It's weird because they're kind of similar in so many ways, um, but then there are these tiny differences which I think are kind of telling. Um, we are able to look at the income spread, not just the, not just the average, and that you know, you're seeing it's, it's fairly close in most of the categories. You just have a little bit more of the Sad Sams in the higher higher numbers, and then when it comes to the lower numbers, just a little bit less. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you had any data on uh, shared revenue, like uh, for a sound recording. Um, if an artist makes a sound recording, they might have to share the, the total revenue of that recording with other people, like a record label, or they might feel that they're uh, not getting the full value of that recording, or other aspects of their income, they might have to share that with somebody. And that might explain a, a sad Sam if they might be making more money, but less of the value of the thing they created goes back to them. Mm -hmm. um, the shared thing and the not shared thing, um, because there are so many ways that people think about their income, some people might think about their income in terms of what did my band make in the last year. So others might think about what did I actually make, could I make my rent? in the last year, and so what we've chosen to do with the design of the survey um, was that uh, we asked people how much money ended up in their bank accounts. So not necessarily kind of from a shared perspective, but just what ended up in their bank account, and that was something that we were able to kind of do consistently, so that way we could compare people. In the interviews, that, that said in the interviews, people were given a lot more leeway, and they were able to talk about kind of arrangements and, and things with other folks as well. So we were able to get a little bit of data about that. I think, or do we have to wrap up or do we have time for one more? Okay, we have time for one more, so you're the lucky guy. Hi. Hi. Um, I have actually two, quick, two questions, but the first one's a real quickie. Um, in your chart on indie rock musician, um, you had knowledge of craft as a revenue stream. What mm -hmm. is that? That was teaching. Okay, and how come it's, is that, did you use the same term for other People. Uh, for other people, it was all kind of slightly different. It's always purple across all of the things. Um, so knowledge of craft is a bucket that includes teaching. Um, and then for other people, let me see. When you looked at these guys, they also had the purple, which was teaching. Um, but because it's a larger bucket, it also includes other things. Um, I'll, I would have to look and see what the exact things were in it. That's it may okay. have included more than just teaching. It's okay. The, the, the more important question I had was, do you have a breakout of respondents by genre of music? Uh, we have a report. We have data memos. We've got 20 of them. One of them is about jazz musicians, so it looks at just the jazz musicians. No, but I mean, of these results that you're showing with the Sad Sams and the Happy Harrys, mm -hmm. um, what percentage of your respondent pool was was each genre, uh, sure. roughly. Mm -hmm. 
that one. Uh, you can see we've got it by jazz, classical, other, other, and then composer. The ends are the total number of respondents, regardless of whether they said yes or no. My music has been okay. All right, thank you. Sure. So thanks for the feedback. Uh, please feel free again to grab me if you would like to talk about this data some more. And please do look for the report when it comes out in the next couple of months at money.futureofmusic.org. Thank you so much. We have a five-minute break before our conversation about copyright that will start in five minutes. Thanks.